I'm Mary Carol Mason, and I'm doing my uh, presentation. You see, search personalization, perils, and opportunities. So, what I'm talking about today is like we're used to search personalization as a pretty like vital tool to be able to help um, sort of use users' intent to be able to get them their information faster. Um, but the other problem is is that uh, particularly uh, Google's uh, personalization techniques can also sort of basically reinforce the dissemination of false. Um, and inaccurate information. And so that's a, um, sort of what I'm going to get into today. And I'm getting a spinny rainbow. It's moving very slowly. Um, so just to sort of introduce myself. I am actually a um, background is as a communications and digital strategist. I've mostly worked, I've generally worked in house for higher ed, um, but right now I'm mostly a master student in the interaction design and information architecture program at the University of Baltimore. So if there are other UB people, yay. Um, and so what are we talking about for, um, what do we mean by personalization? And sort of just sort of talking about when your search engine is using a variety of factors, um, including, but not, including location, device, search history, et cetera, to determine user intent and present most relevant results. Um, and so again, like we are used to it very much as, I, as a helper for things like shopping, where you see a lot of the personalization techniques is in these um, various sorts of um, helpful techniques, like for example, like the product, um, you know, the product carousel. I'm a woman of a certain age and anybody who has my shop can see my shopping history knows I spend a lot of money on expensive skincare. So things when I get things like moisturizer with SPF, um, you know, like it, that, that's really helpful to me. Um, you know, and again, like with the um, the snippets on Google or the knowledge knowledge panel, for example, like right here in DC, if I'm talking about Abraham, if I put in Lincoln into the Google, I'm probably going to get the Abraham Lincoln. Uh, knowledge graph, but knowledge panel. But if I um, were in Lincoln, Nebraska, I'm a lot more likely to get something about the location that I'm in. Um, and again, I use Google a ton for cooking. So almost always, if I put in something like roast chicken or cooking roast chicken, I'm going to get that snippet. <laughs> um, but um, this can actually sort of like backfire in some ways. Uh, Google does have sort of the uh, context of what they call like the, your money or your life and where that, uh, when it, particularly in content that is vital for people's health, economic and other well-being. Um, they will like prioritize more authoritative content up top, but that doesn't always work as well as you would expect, as you can kind of see from the records here. So for example, if I do searching on information about vaccines, to a certain extent, what I get put back to depends on how I phrase the long tail question. Um, if I you know, search under benefits of vaccines, I get all like very quality, quality, quality information or therapeutic. But in other cases, um, if I search under pros and cons of vaccines in a way that makes it sound like I'm open to hearing other uh, perspectives other than that you should get vaccinated, <laughs> um, then I'm likely to get content that is less, author less authoritative. And um, the shopping carousel automatically basically gave me books that are basically uh, pointing out, basically from the perspective of vaccines are dangerous. Um, and then on the second one, we'll talk more about how that happened, but you can see obviously the content is really confusing um, because it opted to choose the, the snippet, the snippet that seems to answer the question, uh, the long tail question, who was the first black president of the United States? Um, and the headline is correct um, from the organization PolitiFact, which is very authoritative, but, uh, but the content is wrong. Um, and so we'll talk about how we get to that. Sort of as a note of how this personalization sort of works and kind of reinforces each other. Now, after working on this presentation, if I Google on my own device, um, who was the first black president, I don't get the regular uh, snippet of Barack Obama. I get this because Google has learned that's what I want to see just because of how I'm 
uh, my search. Another aspect is just sort of like the poor searching, the poor sourcing. So you can see these are six steps for applying for an SBA loan, um, an SBA loan. Um, you would think that would come directly from a Small Business Administration website or maybe a lender that works for SBA loans, but no, this is a content farm. And basically that almost certainly happened because they scraped the content probably directly from SBA um, and then just sort of optimized it to end up in the snippet. So in particular, what do we do when we don't want Google to like decide necessarily for us what's most authoritative and relevant? And of course, I have sort of like the icon with the news, but there's a lot of other information, things like government information, money, health, all sorts of things. You know, when we want to be able to sort of look at our sources more carefully and be able to judge them for ourselves. So Google actually denies a little bit that they do this much personalization, like in terms of action results, but independent research actually shows that that's not actually true. Um, and so sort of like this is a good quote, sort of like talking about from some of the research that I um, looked into for this, is that you know algorithmic personalization intensifies our selective exposure um, beyond our per person's choice. In other words, it's basically reinforcing it is reinforcing um, our very powerful cognitive bias towards uh, repetition, that we believe things that we continue to hear even when they're not true. And so this is what a lot of independent research finds on this, particularly on news personalization, that past search behavior impacts the news results that you're given. Um, the more that you use Google products, the greater are the effects of the personalization on what you get in your search results. Um, and then on do Google News in particular, the top 20% of Google News, of news sources on Google News receive more than 86% of all impressions, which, okay, well that sounds fine, but that top 20% is based a lot more on traffic than it is on accuracy or reliability um, or non-bias. <laughs> Um, in any way. And then plus, if you think about it, you know, how you get your news, there are a lot of subjects where, um, say for like, you know, subjects of local interest or like more niche interest, that, you know, the top 20% of news sites based on traffic are not necessarily going to have the best coverage of that particular topic. And then, um, so now like just thinking about, okay, so what's the impact on, uh, on that, on our search behaviors as a whole? Um, so one recent study shows that 62% of mobile searches in June 2019 are one click, and then 13 to 21 year olds are two times as likely as those over 50 to complete search after viewing just a knowledge panel. So what that sort of like kind of shows is that literally our search behaviors and our, our willingness to evaluate information are somewhat being changed by this information being sort of like fed to us. So it, so it really does matter how that information is coming and whether it's coming from an accurate source, um, you know, whether like a, an algorithm is actually pulling um, information from a reliable source. So what do we do? Um, so here's some, um, just sort of like thinking about some techniques about what, where to go from here. So one of the things is to know how Google measures value to users, and these are some sort of tech, uh, some sort of basic like metrics that, um, that if you do anything with SEO, these are familiar. Um, and one of the things, you know, I've always worked in-house. I've always worked in-house. I've always worked for big organizations. So a lot of times the organizations I'm, I'm in are like, everybody knows who we are. We don't have to worry so much about our SEO. Um, no, <laughs> um, you know, or um, I've also worked places where they're like, oh, we got to get all the backlinks, but um, like people linking back to our data, but they're not really thinking about um, are, is that backlink coming from a, a quality source or is it just sort of like dragging us down? <laughs> uh, because uh, backlinking um, to 
a sort of shady sort of site is not going to help you. Because your goal is not just being findable that people can find you, but to also be authoritative. And so one way that you can sort of like work around this is like just sort of understanding how those snippets, those information snippets work. So the reason why this happened, even though this is a very sort of authoritative site, is that they kind of like opened their content on that page with this historical quote, which, you know, was sort of like an interesting way to sort of like human, in a human way to write the page, to read the content, but it seems to answer a question, was the first black president John Hansen? <laughs> Uh, you know, which is a long tail question, um, but then it turns out, you know, but, but because it's that, that quote, um, that answer turns out to be wrong, even though the rest of the article basically goes in of why that's incorrect. So really what you want to be doing to sort of like make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen to you <laughs> is to be, you know, writing using your inverted pyramid. Need to know, nice to know, and then optimize to answer a user uh, users are actual questions. And then also backing it up. Um, even if a human would look at your site and be like, yes, we are the people who are authority, who have the authority on this subject. A lot of this is happening through AI. So your page needs to actually send the authority signals out to make sure that um, somebody who has maybe scraped your content isn't getting, right, isn't getting that content shoved above you. And then this is just sort of like, you know, basic good IA and SEO practice. Um, because what this will do is that even if you're competing with content in a knowledge panel or a snippet, um, this will also sort of like help make sure that your content is a little bit more likely to be very prominent on the page. You know, making sure that you're getting like those nice site links, um, you know, where Google has basically kind of like given you your top level architecture all on the first page of search results. Um, you know, so if you're avoiding your corporate lingo, nice clear URLs, um, let the headings um, help you with your page hierarchy so that it crawls better and it's a good, better user experience for everybody. Um, and then the other thing is it's just sort of um, um, infinite scroll is really popular right now, um, but it can be a little dicey, um, so maintaining footer navigation can be um, more helpful. And then sort of the last uh, thing is claiming your knowledge, if you're in a, working on a site for a prominent enough organization to have a knowledge panel, you can claim it and you should. Um, I just did like a quick survey of a bunch of very prominent news organizations. Only about 50% of them have actually done this part. <laughs> um, and so what happens if you don't, it, what happens if you don't is that you're sort of like dependent on the, you're dependent on the AI it just pulls content from wherever and you don't have any control over it. If you've claimed it, then you can actually submit information um, for what you think should be there. Um, and so that sort of helps you protect your own content and online reputation. And that's all for me today. Um, and if you wanted to look at the references, there's a whole bunch of academic references. The slides are available at that link. <laughs>